I grew up in Germany during the Nazi period, and I came to this country when I was 15. And then I had to work in a factory because we had no resources. And I went to night school. So it was not a rational ambition for me to become a world statesman. Then I became, over time, a professor, and I, had, I wrote about world history, but I was not an active participant. In 1968, President Nixon, newly elected, invited me to become his security advisor. And as the security advisor, all the problems that have to do with national security flow through the office of the security advisor to the president. So it is in that period that I became an active participant because President Nixon sent me as his principal negotiator to negotiate the end of the Vietnam War, the opening to China, and three Middle East peace agreements. Even that has an interesting aspect because I had been really advisor to, to Governor Rockefeller, who was a opponent within the Republican Party of President Nixon. So when President Nixon offered me that position, I said I need to talk to Governor Rockefeller, and with, with whom I'm associated. And Rockefeller said to me, think about it this way. He is taking a much bigger chance on you than you are taking on him. And so then I accepted the job. And after that, I thought I was involved in the affairs of foreign policy and national security policy. The first thing to remember is the administration in which I served did not get involved in Vietnam. We found the war, and our task was to liquidate it. Uh, in retrospect, we got involved in Vietnam because we thought that the crisis in Vietnam was a uh, part of a vast communist uh, system, and that the way to resist a global penetration of communism was to find it wherever it occurred. Uh, that was sort of the accepted view, and this was done in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. I think in retrospect it was a mistake, but it was an honorable mistake by people carrying out the traditions of previous American uh, foreign policy. The question of how do you get out when you have 500,000 troops in place and you have a million allied troops and about the same number of hostile troops, how you can get out without producing a catastrophe. And secondly, how you can get out without undermining the faith in the United States. Uh, uh, that was the problem that the administration which I served faced, which inherited 550,000 troops in place. Uh, we thought the honor uh, of the United States required a gradual extrication. There was no dispute about getting out. The dispute was how to get out and under uh, what conditions. It was easy to take heroic stances, carrying placards around. Those were not the people who had to implement the decisions. I've written a book that will come out, which will explain, which will discuss uh, what we did. Uh, the administration which I served found 550,000 troops there, and we got them out. And there can be a lot of heroes of retroactive 
consideration who can have brilliant ideas what uh, what should have been done and what might have been done uh, we did the best we could under the extremely difficult circumstances and there's nothing I would significantly do differently. There's a shred of evidence that American prisoners were left. There have been congressional hearings that went into everything. And one ought to think about it rationally. Why would an American administration that is accused on the one side of having fought unnecessarily long would end it by leaving American prisoners there. It's not a rational accusation to make. Missing and unaccounted for has to do with the difficulty of the terrain. And uh, the uh, Vietnamese had an obligation to uh, account for the missing. And they seem to have a warehouse of bones, and every time they want to make an impression in America, they give us a few bones. Uh, that's a disgrace. There's a fifth of the human population, uh, and uh, it was not natural for the United States and China to have no contacts. It uh, made it extremely difficult to conduct foreign policy if on every issue. China was a congenital enemy, and therefore we thought we were serving the cause of peace by bringing China into relationship with the United States and thereby with the rest of the world because China didn't have much contact with any other, no contact with any other country either. So we led the way into dialogue with China and uh, thereby made it possible to have a wider international system. My father was a teacher in a gymnasium in sort of middle school, and he lost his job, and uh, uh, which is something that never happened normal, <laughs> in normal life. And so the condition of our family changed from being members of the community to being a uh, discriminated minority. I was a kid, and. Uh, Children adjust to everything, so I can't say that. I mean, the Hitler Youth people could beat one up on the street when one walked, but that almost became part of the existence. I didn't realize how odd that was until I came to the United States. So I can't say that I suffered deeply, but it was, I, I developed understanding uh, when I teach at public schools in New York, I understand what minorities feel. We were very lucky that my parents and my brother, so the whole nuclear family, came together. About uh, 15 of our relatives, that is, brothers and sisters of my parents and grandmother didn't make it. But the nucleus family, we were all together. And of course, for my family and me, coming to America saved our lives. But more important than that, we lived in a totalitarian state. And when I, we came to America and you could see how people f talk to each other and dealt with each other, that was a liberating experience. And uh, I wrote an essay in high school about coming as a refugee. And what you find many things different and you miss many things. But then you remember that here you can walk across the street with your head erect, and then that makes it all worthwhile.
I did not watch myself with rapt attention and fascination to see what I might do next. So I felt if I was doing something that fulfilled me at the moment and which would add to my knowledge and that that's all I needed for that year. And when did I realize I had a growth capacity? Really not until I came out of the army. But I wasn't, I did not think that it was, I didn't look at myself as a stranger who had to promote his own growth. I thought the growing part would be inseparable from my commitment part. The military service was tremendously important because I came to this country, as I said, as a refugee. And I lived in a section of New York where there were also a lot of other refugees. So it wasn't in the army that until the army that I met what you'd call average Americans on a regular basis. In the factory in which I worked, there were mostly Italian refugees or Italian immigrants. It wasn't so much refugees. In my military service, I was with the 84th Infantry Division. And that division was composed of people from Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin. And that was and is sort of the heartland of America. So <clears throat> it was tremendously important in teaching me about how the typical or average American things. And in the army, you are dependent on each other. And nobody really cares what you did before. And it was an absolutely essentially formative aspect of my life. I can't say I enjoyed digging foxholes and things like this, but uh, in retrospect, it was a very important part of my life. He turned out to be a man who affected my life by calling my attention to what he thought were these qualities. Uh, if I can ascribe it to anything, which I didn't at the time, it's having seen fairly early in my life how a apparently normal existence can disintegrate under the impact of dictatorship and uh, the imposition of force and therefore to reflect about how one can uh, mitigate or avoid such conditions. He wasn't really an instructor. He was a, a very odd personality, actually. He was a German, not Jewish, who had left Germany for uh, out of conviction. And he was much older than I and had been drafted into the army. He, had stupendous uh, education, and he was uh, doing odd jobs for division headquarters. And I heard him speak once and uh, dropped him a note, which I practically never do. And so we got to know each other. And for about uh, 20 years afterwards, he became somebody that I took very seriously. Then when I got into government, he thought that I was making too many agreements with the Soviets and our relations then ended on his side. But he was a huge influence on my life. This particular book grew out of uh, something at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York 
and Harvard only played a very indirect role in the sense that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., and I were debating about nuclear strategy and in the way amateurs do. I didn't know anything much about it. But I wrote him my observations, and he sent them to Foreign Affairs. And Foreign Affairs published them, and on the basis of that I was asked to be study director of a study of a group of very senior people. And that produced this book, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, then, which became sort of a standard work. The philosophy of that book was what is now fairly commonplace. But in those days, the official policy of the United States was massive retaliation, which was that no matter how war started, we would respond with the massive use of nuclear weapons. And I took the position that this was uh, not possible as the national strategy of a uh, democracy, that the loss of human life was too uh, uh, vast, and that in the end we would paralyze ourselves by adopting such a strategy because we would never wish to carry out what the principle of our strategy was and that we would be blackmailing ourselves and if we didn't, we would be doing something that would pr produce such consequences that the world would never be the same. So and true, that, that, became, that became more or less the adopted doctrine and as the decades went by. But in the 50s, it was, uh, it was relatively new. I was sort of conscious, self-conscious about my accent. But in the army, nobody ever mentioned it. So I thought I had lost it. It wasn't until I got out of the army back to Harvard that people started asking about my accent. But by the time I was in office, it had become sort of a trademark. And not consciously, but so then people didn't ask me about my accent. They sometimes made it became a subject of benevolent jokes. But I, we didn't get much hate mail about my accent. I guess this is something born into you. But I've been lucky in the sense that all of the li my life that I could control, uh, I was unable to do what I love doing and what I'm most interested in, which is study of history, study of foreign policy, and the execution of foreign policy. And I had the good fortune that all my life, even today, I can still combine all these. I know people always expect you to say that you have some basic regret. And then, as everybody, I didn't get every thing at the time that I wanted. But the basic direction of my life was the better. I wanted it to go. And so I think I was extremely fortunate. I tell them, I mean, there are a lot of ambitious younger people. And some of them have a specific job that they think they want to do. I always tell them, do what most interests you in any one year in which you can grow a bit and let the job take care of itself. If you are good, a job will find you. If you strive all the time for immediate advancement, you're bound to get disappointed somewhere along the road. I work all the time. Um, 
not for financial reasons, but because I do things I want to do. And so I'm writing a book right now, and of course I want to finish that. And there are various international issues in which I get involved. But I have no specific ambition. I'll be 94 at my next birthday, so I don't have to fill an indefinite number of years.